Blog Talk Radio. Yes, yes, y'all. Sure. You are now listening to the shofar blowing. The shofar is a ram's horn that is blown to inspire the people to do their thing, and the shofar is blown to coordinate a king or a queen. And today, the shofar is being blown to awaken the feminine intuition. This is Faux Show Holistic Health on Blog Talk Radio, and I'm your host, Shofar, from Faux Show Energy Work. And today, my guest is Yao Morris, a.k.a. Master Yao. Um, he is the author of The Return, uh, The Oracle of Kim Sanu, The Awakening the Master Masculine, and Awakening the Master Feminine. So we're going to be talking about that one today. And uh, he's also a tantric energy work or tantra energy healer extraordinaire. Uh, so bring him out, bring him out. Master Yao, how you doing? I'm doing great. How you be? Oh, man, you know how we do. Feeling good, feeling good. Aligned and connected. How about yourself? A little trouble dialing in, but I'm I'm here and I'm ready. All right, that's what's up. Definitely, you know. Uh, well, that, you know, there's so much going on. Uh, you know, family, those of you listening now and those listening in the now that we call the future, um, uh, looking present to today's message. Uh, we've been, for those of you who've uh, been checking us out uh, in the past, you know we're doing the, the House of the Woman now, or the House of the Womb, as I like to call it. Uh, we've done the House of the Man already. That's up on YouTube and iTunes. And today we're going to be going into the Seated Hawk, uh, which is an our being, uh, the feminine intuition. And we can awaken that personality type or that personality structure in ourselves. So I'm going to you know, let you take it from there. Uh, so can you explain to the family, first off, as a foundation, what is the Seated Hawk or what is this, uh, this energy that we're talking about today? There are four archetypes of feminine energy. The moon, which is the maternal energy, and probably the most dominant of the female energies. The elegant rose, which is a um, creative attribute. It's a pleasure attribute, and it's a form uh, of the woman attribute. The treasure chest, which is like the nesting instinct, when you see birds, when they are when they are ready to start having um, uh, young birds, they start to get into a nesting format where they want to build and get prepared for the family that's coming. In the human, it you know it manifests in a more complex form. The seated hawk is the most complex of the four archetypes. So. To really understand it, to go above and beyond what we talk about in the book, we have to talk about or discuss the four-body model of human, of human life. In other words, um, humans don't have one body. They have four. Mm-hmm. So we have a cell body that, that most people are familiar with, then there is an energy body which people are starting to become more familiar with. They've heard talk of chakras and auric fields and this type of thing. And then there are two bodies above that, the light body and what is called the quantum field, which is like the beginning or the origin of, the, of all the bodies. And science is studying that now, and they're getting more familiar with it Uh, every day. Mm -hmm. So, in a nutshell, the seated hawk is that part of the woman that gives her the ability to operate her upper bodies. Mm. So, it's, it's the part of her that allows her to interact with the unseen body, the unseen realms. So we often hear talk of our gifts, and men and women have gifts. You know, common gifts that people talk about are clairvoyance, uh, oracle abilities, 
the ability to heal, the ability to, that ha- to have this knowing that is instinctual. In other words, it just seems to come out of nowhere. You don't train or you're not educated to know. The knowledge just comes uh, mm-hmm. as if out of like magic. Of course, it's not magic, but and basically, this um, seated hawk uh, is is when the woman gains some ability to access her control panel. So, in a website, you have um, a dashboard, a control panel that's that's like the webmaster behind the scenes, and that allows you to make changes in your website. Um, You also have the dashboard on a car that allows you to change how the car functions. And um, uh, you have, um, you know, on a ship down underneath four or five stories below deck, you have an engine room. And when you go down there, it's filled with pumps and, and pipes and instruments and devices and inside is a control room with all of the different dials and gauges and things showing how the entire operation is going. And that's really the heart of the ship. That's what makes the ship go and do. And so okay. the seated hook is that part of the woman that gives her access to that control room, that control panel, that part of her that allows her to interact with things that are not part of the normal cell body, not part of this reality that we can see with our senses. That's family. Take that, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, so, and I, I, some women out there, you know, and I'm sure the guys too, the fellas out there is like, wow, the woman has this in her. It's like, how come, how come we don't know, we, we don't, we don't see this, um, at the forefront more because this sounds pretty. This sounds like some Marvel shit, really. Yeah, what, what's going on there, right? Well, in indigenous cultures, they attempt mm. to to identify the young girls who have, you know, some natural ability in this regard, and they try mm. to train them. But even in indigenous cultures, for the most part. They have forgotten all of the science of it. And so, you know, they do it to the extent that that their customs uh, allow. Uh, In Grand Trine, you know, we have studied this for many, many years. And so, you know, um, we feel that, that really, you know, women should really make an effort to instigate, to initiate this part of their being. Now, all women have some ability to awaken their seated hawk, uh, but some more than others. And so you start to see this manifest in young girls, especially teen girls. Mm -hmm. It starts to manifest as soon as they enter puberty and they have their Mm -hmm. first cycle. And then what we see is that the young girls start to um, have experiences and they start to feel weird. Uh, Some talk Mm. about it, some don't. Normally, they'll go to their mothers and say, Mom, you know, I'm seeing dead people (laughs) or I'm hearing Mm. voices or I'm starting to get strange things happening where I just, I have these premonitions. Mm -hmm. And so some young girls, I'd say maybe eight or nine percent, when they're teenagers, their seated hawk attempts to come online. Mm -hmm. If there are no rites of passage, if the mother doesn't understand, and often they don't, if the society Mm -hmm. we live in doesn't really talk about this, then often the teen girls uh, don't like this faculty and they seek to suppress it. So Mm -hmm. they start having weird dreams and, you know, and they talk to their girlfriends 
and the girl was like, ah, no, that never happened to me. <laughs> and so they start to think, what's wrong with me? Because I'm not normal. Mm-hmm. And the opposite is true. It's that they have, for whatever reason, maybe it's their bloodline, maybe it runs in their family, maybe they did it in past lives, maybe they just, this is just something that's one of their gifts in this lifetime. We, we don't always know why, but a certain amount of young girls start their teenage life with the capacity to, to easily bring this faculty online. It just takes a little bit of effort and training, and they are able to, to access their control panel. And once they do, uh, there is much more here than in the physical body. In other words, some women are athletes, some are very smart mentally, some are very healthy, some have psychological issues, some, you know, um, are very astute at understanding men or understanding uh, dance or understanding um, cooking or whatever. Some mm-hmm. just are very maternal oriented. But mm-hmm. those things are simple compared to the seated hawk faculty. When she mm-hmm. starts to look into this control room, there mm-hmm. is a bunch of stuff there, a lot of stuff. And if she doesn't have some help, some assistance, it can be overwhelming what is possible. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I can see that. I I can see where it would actually, and you actually talk about that in your book too, as far as... Um, you know the non the non feminine mode not being reinforced and everything, how it literally can change her personality. Exactly. So men have this capacity, but to a much less extent because it requires that she operate for the most part in her right brain hemisphere and not in the left brain hemisphere. So in the left brain, you got, you know, the front cortex and all that stuff where it's, you know, where it's really dealing with reasoning, thinking, logic, lineal progression, you know, interaction with the senses, that type of stuff. This is the opposite of that. The right brain hemisphere, you're dealing with images, and images link you to all types of faculties and powers using the image is the key so that, you know, she can um, place an image into her mind and that will trigger uh, some abilities to see or do things that aren't on this realm. In other words, oftentimes they know beforehand when someone is going to die. Oftentimes they are standing at the hospital bed and they just intuitively know what, why this person is sick. In other words, you know, the person got sick, you know, they took them to the hospital, and doctors trying to figure out what's exactly wrong. And they might identify the surface symptoms. And she's standing there, and somehow she knows this is what's wrong with this person. And she may try to tell somebody, she may not. Uh, she oftentimes is talking to a boy, <coughs> and it's almost like she can read his mind. She's like empathic. She has certain feelings. The problem is without training, she tends to think that the empathic suggestion she gets is the totality of his feeling when she is only getting one part of it, the, the most prominent part or the most high frequency part that's that's communicating with her and there may be other parts that she doesn't sense right then and thus she comes away with the wrong idea mm. you know she sensed she senses that this boy is sensitive about stuff but she doesn't understand that there may be other things that she you know that didn't scream out at her 
um, they're, they're typically empathic. In other words, they just, when they're around people, they tend to feel what other people feel. And this can cause them to be very depressed, can cause them to feel confused, can cause them to feel uh, angry, or can cause them to feel that they have to be, they have to take action now. I got to do, I got to get involved in stuff, but they have to be trained to distance themselves and disconnect from all of this information coming in from other people because their thoughts and their conceptions are different than all of the information that they're tapping into from their environment. And therefore, you know, you, you'll see them oftentimes going through three or four months of depression for no reason and it doesn't have anything to do with them. They think that it does, but it does not. The depression is because someone close to them is depressed. And the reason that they are feeling what the other person feels is so that they can cure it, they can fix it. That's their job. So, you know, they are able to sense the pain of other people, and because of that, they're able to fix it. Um, so, you know, oftentimes you'll see an 18 year old girl and she's just really struggling through life because she's around a group of dysfunctional people (laughs) and therefore people think that she's dysfunctional Mm -hmm. and it's a simple matter of training her to disconnect from what other people are generating and separate that from her identity. Uh, once she's able to do that, then, you know, she's, then she'll find out that she's perfectly normal and she's perfectly happy. And, you know, when she wants to, she can tune into these other feelings. And when she wants to, she can tune out. This is absolutely critical that she gain this ability before the age of 21. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, she'll go through life feeling the feelings of other people as her own, when mm-hmm. indeed these are not her feelings at all. Mm-hmm. She's oftentimes uh, very in tune with her ancestors who have passed on. So she may mm-hmm. not be very empathic to her mother or grandmother who are living, but she is probably feeling her great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother who are dead, who are ancestors, Mm -hmm. and she's probably very much in touch with them emotionally. And if she knows this and she can identify which stream of emotion she's looking at, it's very fortunate. If she does not know this, oftentimes she forms a, a pain body or a counterfeit personality based on these ancestors that she is in attunement with. Critical for the Seated Hawk woman that she understands the difference between what she's thinking and feeling and what she is sensing with her higher power. <clears throat> this is absolute. And so even if a mother or father or husband uh, does not know all the details of occult science, they need to impress this lesson upon her as early as possible for her psychological well-being. Uh, These women have been here for 10,000 years. And in some societies, the science of how to train them is high, and they are capable of doing many things. Most often, they are employed by rulers of nations and chiefs and heads of great institutions as oracles because they are able to sort of sense the future and sense the underlying principles behind a deal, a a money transaction, or the national mood. And she's a great advisor. Um, 
And you can train women to develop their faculty. Um, not too many can do it, but Grand Trine does it, and others can do it as well. So the seated hawk faculty is like the queen bee. So when you look at bees and wasps and hornets and, and things like that that, are, that have a hive, the insects that have a hive, what we see is that there is one entity there. Typically, in the, in the bee colony, the queen is kept far underground in the safest place in the colony, a place that's always dry, and she's given the best food, and she has a group of males around her who simply protect her and constantly provide any of her needs, including her sexual needs. So the queen bee typically is the most evolved bee in the colony because she knows. Mm -hmm. She doesn't learn. She just knows. She, she chemically imprints all the male bees so that they know what to do when they go outside, where to collect food, which foods to collect, which enemies to destroy, which enemies to run from, what to leave alone, and, and basically she runs the colony, the entire hive, 100,000 bees from one throne inside. And she does this using her higher body, her control panel, her knowledge of things uh, outside of this realm. And so, you know, the human female has the same and even more complex faculty and so it's very important that the society learn to recognize and train the women who have this capacity. And once the woman gets some level of control of the seated hawk, then it's up to men to service her and to obey, to follow, to, to pay close and strict attention to the things that she says and the instructions that she gives out, oftentimes, you know, it can be the matter of life or death, going to prison or remaining free, uh, being able to survive or not, making the right choices in your career, when to have kids and when to avoid pregnancy, uh, how to gain money so that it doesn't have uh, negative consequences down the road, which job to take, which job to avoid. Today, we don't honor and, and support the seated hawk in women. And it is a very unfortunate scenario that we don't. So many bad decisions could be avoided if men learn what to do, how to react to the seated hawk. Hmm. Wow. It sounds like this is the reason uh, because of, uh, I wonder, if, like we talk about, you know, the grand year, the, the, the Kali, you know, and the Krita Yugas and the, the, the Yugas and everything, if as consciousness has somewhat declined and now we're, we're kind of come, coming out of the Kali Yuga, actually. Um, but I wonder if at the decline, that's when we find that uh, man has to create oracle systems like the I Ching, the Meduna Tir, the uh, Ifa because we've basically done such a good job of uh, quieting and silencing the living oracles. What do you, what do you, how do you feel about that? You are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. The oracles, uh, the Maduna Tia, the I Ching, the uh, Ifa, um, uh, the, the Native American medicine wheel, the Tao, uh, of Asia and so many, many others are like a stepping stone. The, the, the woman who has to develop her seated hawk begins by using the oracle in the mechanical way. And after each reading, she does a, a special meditation to get greater insight into the reading. And in a matter of about a year, she can do the oracle readings 
without the cards or the bones or the coins or whatever is used. And she simply just, you know, listens to the question or looks at the particular uh, circumstances. She does a meditation at night, and in the morning, she is able to give counsel on that reading. And then this is another stepping stone because after this, eventually it will cause her to develop more of this faculty to the point where she can become a counselor. In other words, she doesn't need to do an oracle reading. She just starts to tell you what needs to happen. And so in, in the Native American tradition, when women develop this oracle ability to the third stage, um, oftentimes they were only 21, 22. And they would sit wow. in the council. And the council consisted of, you know, 20 or 30 older men, like 40 to 50 years of age. And what we what we heard from oral tradition is that often the men did not like <laughs> this young girl telling them something that was different from what they felt. And when they when this happened, what they would do is they would adjourn and they would, you know, then the female council uh, would convene. And they would consider mm. what the young girl said and they would give their opinion and then usually the chief would, would weigh all of this and make a decision. But you know, they could not dismiss it. It's mm. confirmed that she has her seated hawk online. You mm. can't just dismiss her. Uh, and they were smart enough to know that even though they most oftentimes did not agree with what she said, they were smart enough not to just dismiss it. They'd get a second opinion. And today, you know, we don't know enough about it to, to, to make a good you know, we're not making good decisions about it. We don't know how to evaluate her to see if she is, you know, fully in her power. I mean, because at the first stage, as I said before, the woman is confused. She has not been, learned how to separate the intuition and the wisdom she's getting from the simple emotional feelings of the people around her. So she thinks that she's getting, you know, intuition, but it's just the feelings of dysfunctional people. And she has to learn to make this, uh, be able to determine one from the other. And so until, she, until it can be certified that she has l learned how to do this, you can't follow her advice. But once she has gotten to that point, that, that past the oracle stage, you're really foolish to ignore what she is saying because it is, it is higher than the oracles because she's tapping into her light body. She's tapping into the realm of angels, higher entities, ascended ancestors, and things like that. And it's way above what we're dealing with out here you know, with with just book learning and talking to experts that, you know, and and just, you know, trying to make a decision based on the logic of it. So much sense, Master Yao, from, uh, like, thinking of, uh, I think we, as human beings, we look at ourselves as that individual leaf, you know, on a tree oftentimes, whereas once that feminine faculty that you're talking about is online, uh you were, were actually able to become not just aware, but actually feel in a, in a body sense and in, in, a, in a really real way the, the full tree. You know, and, and therefore the connectedness, uh, and not just in an in a intellectual way, you know, when we read these, you know, these cliche, you know, cards and stuff like that. I mean, we can get it on that level, and that, that's nice. But what you're talking about is a whole other level where, this being, this woman, uh, this womb being now is actually able to feel that she is the whole tree. Exactly. The queen bee knows what every type of bee in her colony is about, his, his capabilities, 
his function, mm. his incarnation mm-hmm. objective. And so she can be any of the components. Uh, it's like, you know, the, wow. the conductor of an orchestra doesn't play an instrument, but he knows how to play all of them. He knows the role, how they all contribute to the, to the masterpiece. And he's able to, or she, is able to conduct the orchestra and train them and get them to perform a masterpiece. And so most women uh, who are in their moon or who are in their elegant rose or in their treasure chest, to some extent, their role is to follow the man. In other words, the woman has the uh, ability and the man is the executor. The man is the person who does it. Um, And so in many cases, the woman is supposed to be following the man. And so the man is directing the plan of the family. But, and men are okay with that. But when you get to the seated hawk, it's the opposite. It's, you don't, it's not a situation where you're really trying to um, second guess the seated hawk woman. That's not how it goes. You're basically trying to follow, and that's your role, to follow. However, you know, oftentimes you, it, you can't institute her plan the way she brings it forward because society isn't perfect, and oftentimes you may not have the money, there may not be the means, it may require that the whole community participate, so there are Oftentimes, the man has to uh, alter or modify her her plan to fit the reality of the world that we are in, but even so, instituting her plan. And a lot of times, you are just not going to understand it. You're not. You can't have the understanding that she's got, and and this is difficult for men because. You know, most men today are, they're acculturated to make women, to place women into a second class role that they're not capable of handling money correctly, uh, making certain decisions correctly, and, and, and running a family correctly, which may or may not be true. But when you get to the seated hawk thing, you know, the man is in the back seat. He's not, he's not in the driver's seat. He's not in the passenger seat. He's in the back seat, and he basically needs yeah. to follow instructions. This is very, very difficult for men, extremely important, that he gain an understanding of this, of this female archetype uh, to, 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 to ignore it, to go counter to it, to not support it, is perilous. Amen. Amen. I I, I love it. I mean, <clears throat> it sounds like to me a coming home of sorts of like egg, and we can that that's and swim around out there and want to you know stay individuated and uh, everything, or it can go ahead and come on home to that egg, you know, if she's, if it's ovulating there and, uh, and uh, go to a higher state of being. So I think we, uh, the masculine, we, we would do ourselves as a, a huge disservice to not go ahead and, and go, go, go to the egg and, and, and uh, humbly and allow us to come into a whole nother way of being as a society or as a, in our individual lives. Uh, wow. So much good stuff in there. Uh, I want to talk uh, a little bit on the the human intelligence and the four modes of expression because I feel like that's another component that will help make all of this make even more sense for the the family out there. So uh, as far as like deductive, uh, inductive, and and maybe just touching on those, but really focusing on uh, synthesis and integration. So our educational system and our way of 
coming to conclusions and entertaining concepts in Western society is based on either deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. And both of these are very good at certain types of, uh, you know, like if you're in business or you're in college or you're trying to, you know, solve math problems or things like that. Yep, those things are great. Um, and each of the four archetypes of the woman tends to, you know, lean toward one of the four ways of thinking. So you have inductive reasoning, which is good for, you know, planning a project that requires logical thinking. You know, you're planning a wedding. Uh, you have deductive reasoning, which is good for math, and you know, um, figuring out your budget and things like that. You know, but then you have something called synthesis. And in the synthesis uh, modality, you look at the whole and you make decisions on any particular part based on what the whole says. So you're looking at the whole organism, the whole economy, the whole society, the whole community, the whole family. Hmm. And you're saying, okay, we have a 10-year-old who's artistic. And that's part of our hold. And then, you know, uh, we have a certain amount of time and we have two parents and we have a certain amount of money. And so you, you, you can't make decisions for the whole without taking into account this one child that's autistic. And so they're looking at the whole organism and they're making decisions. It's, it's a higher form of thinking above deductive or inductive reasoning. But the most advanced is the intuitive. So it's, it's more advanced than the synthesis, the synth, you know, where you're looking at the whole. The intuitive is basically, you know, it goes to the higher realms to get the solution based on, you know, the... Um, based on being one with the thing you're trying to understand. So you want to know about a car. Uh, it's a used car. It's three years old. And you want to know should you buy it or not. Um, you can use the deductive reasoning and say, let me find out the history of the car. Do I trust the owner? Uh, how many miles was it driven? Give me all the facts, 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 facts. And you can make your decision on that. Intuitively, basically then, you become one with the car. And the car is going to tell you everything that's wrong with it and right with it. And then you simply go straight to the thing that you're concerned about. Okay, this car is going, it's got a bad radiator. Nobody can see that. Nobody knows that, not even the past owner. And it's going to break down in four months. And so you say intuitively, I'm, I got a bad feeling about this car, something to do with the water system. We're not going to buy this one. Bam, that's it. Um, you're going to say, well, dig, the price is right. I like the model. I like the, you know, it's the reviews and consumer reports is good. Why don't you want to buy this one? <laughs> and the woman is like, I got a bad feeling. Something about the water system in this car is not right. We're not going to buy this one. If she's seated hawk, don't buy that car. Because, you know, basically the car, she has become one with the car. And the car has told her what it is. The car has given her, it's, you know, it, 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 the car knows what it is. And so, you know, um, this is something that, you know, it's hard today because we're so into such a left brain society. You know, you got the internet and you've got all this stuff like that. You go on YouTube and find a video for the car and it tells you how to check the car out. You do CarMax and you do this and all the kind of stuff like that. But these things are fallible. The intuition at the seated hawk level is pretty much infallible. Um, everybody wants to know why. Mm. And oftentimes the seated hawk woman can't tell you why she doesn't know why she knows 
She just knows something about this car's water circulating system is not right. That's all she knows. That's all she needs to know. And so, I mean, when you look at these different types of ways, we don't teach the intuitive education system anymore. We don't teach the synthesis system anymore. The Native Americans were very big on the synthesis system, so they basically you know, taught their young to be in harmony with the entire ecology, to know everything, to be one with it. The Tao of China taught the same thing, the synthesis system. The, 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 the Shaolin monks were taught to be one with everything, to understand the totality, and to, you know, don't separate yourself from the whole of the universe. And so that's, that gave them a great insight. But we don't teach that anymore. And certainly, very few people are able to teach the intuitive uh, in educational system. In other words, how to gain the faculties where you can intuit accurate knowledge. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> It's explained there, and the first part is literally like no child left behind, you know, and we can definitely see in today's world where uh, leadership that does not incorporate this, um, I feel like it is one of the big missteps of of our current society or so-called civilization. So much good stuff there. Um you know, we're coming close to the, the closing here. And I, one last thing I wanted to touch on, because I think it would be good for the family just to hear you break it down, um, is trance. I know you talked earlier about that these faculties and these things come online by trance. What is meant by, what is meant by trance, and uh, can you explain that a little bit to the family? So the brain is a wonderful machine. And uh, it operates in four or five different bandwidths of electromagnetic activity. When you are in the B or the beta uh, brainwave activity, this is where most people are living. It's a very high frequency in terms of what's happening is um, the brain is very active. It's a lot of um, high activity. It's mainly a left brain thing, and it, you know, it requires a lot of glucose, and, and basically you're focusing on the frontal lobe, and you know, um, you're in these high-frequency bandwidths. But the brain gets tired here, and it's hard to go to sleep after that, and you, you know, uh, you're not meant to operate in this beta brain, uh, wave for too long. When you start to play, when you become sexually aroused, when you are, start to have fantasies or daydreams, when you um, uh, are watching TV, or when you're reading a very interesting book, the brain drops down to the next lower level of brainwave activity. And so you drop out of the B to the next lower bandwidth, and you're right on the borderline of trance. And so you will see people watching TV, and you will say, Mary, and she won't hear you. You have to say it three or four times, Mary, and you go, Mary, you know, and then she'll finally snap out of it. And then she said, what, what? You know, uh, uh, people listening to music and things like that, they're right on the borderline of trance. When you go beneath that, you get into the delta brain wave lengths. You're in a different bandwidth of brain activity, much lower and much more concentrated, much more focused. And so you're able to focus on certain things much more deeply. But when you get down into, you know, the delta, uh, you're in trance. So the brain is not able to be aware of what's going on outside of your body. In other words, you're not very aware of what you can see, even if your eyes are open, or what you're hearing, all of those things. You're, you're, you're getting the input, but the brain is not processing it. And so what you're processing 
is what's going on inside the brain. You know, so you're processing something from a different wavelength. And so the brain is in a resting type state where it's not really dealing with all this outside stuff. It shut that off. And you're in trance, and which means you're turned internally. You can control the trance through a lot of different things, binaural beats, mantras, holy sounds, uh, uh, waterfalls, the waves at the beach, rain beating on the roof. All of these things will tend to lure the brain into trance. Um, and, so, you know, there, there are certain types of things that you can do that's emotional that will put people into trance. And then their, their eyes are open and they can still hear, sort of, but they're not focused on that. So the best example of trance is hypnosis. So in hypnosis, the person is really focused on the person who is talking, that the person who is hypnotizing. And that's, they're really focused on his or her voice. They're not really focused on everything else so much. They're in trance. And so when you're in trance, whatever you're in trance with, you can really act on that. You can focus on that in a way that you can't when you're awake fully. Um, another form of trance is when you're asleep. So sleep mm -hmm. will put you in, in, the, in the delta wavelengths. But, of course, when you're asleep, you're not, your brain is not really running things. Your subconscious mind is running it now, and it's sort of replaying stuff and trying to sort stuff out and whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, so basically the seated hawk, what she does is she has mm -hmm. certain meditations that she does to, to take her into trance, and normally she has a goal that she, you know, has, has visualized that she wants to accomplish while she's in trance. Uh, mm. It's not a, much a thought. It's not so much a words, but it's a vision. It has to be visual. It has to be right brain. And then she can use whatever she uses to take her into trance. Once she gets there, this image triggers her. Her mind holds the image uh, very vividly, and it causes her to go through whatever thing she needs to go to to get the desired outcome. Uh, and then you can go deeper than that. You can go into th theta trance, brainwave states, and even lower, you know, gamma. And in these uh, deep trance states, she can change her cells. She can change her body. Uh, I've seen women who their bodies became like steel. You couldn't, you couldn't hurt it. You could take a knife and hit them, and, and it won't punch you their skin. And you say to yourself, whoa, how can you do that? But I've seen it with my own eyes where women are laying across a, a bed, and you know people hit them with hammers and stuff, and it's like hitting wood. They, you, you can't, you know, they're in deep trance and they're, they're focused with such, uh, you know, laser-like thing that they've changed their cells, they can change their field around them, and they have a control of their involuntary states. So trance is very, very powerful. Wow, wow, wow. It's so, so much there to to, you know, to take on that journey and to really realize our human potential, our human being uh, potential, how much uh, we really have available to ourselves. And we've been playing ourselves very small. Uh, that's one thing to really take away from this conversation, family. It's like there, we, we talk about space being the final frontier. Some people even talk about you know, the depths of the ocean. All of that is well and good. I would say the depths of our consciousness and, you know, what we have available just in our own being, there's a universe there. And uh, so, yeah, it sounds like trance is the door to get there, to start uh, exploring. Uh, wow, well, time goes by quick when it's a great conversation always. Um, uh, 
and we even extended it some. I uh, needed to do that because it's just so much information. Uh, so in wrapping up here, uh, so I would like to, you know, definitely, I know that, uh, you know, people want to learn more about the trance and everything, but to bring on that seated hawk that you're talking about, you have a class coming up, you know. So in closing out, if you want to uh, leave the family with um, what you have going on and uh, any last gem. Well, yes. So the first thing that I would say to any woman or man that's interested in the CD talk is to purchase the book, Awakening the Master Feminine, which goes into detail about all four archetypes. Um, then a lot of people ask me, how can I, you know, as a woman, activate my archetypes? And so there are many different ways. Um, one of them that's, that's more available than most is through Tantra, and so we have taught that, but there is something even higher than Tantra, and so uh, what we talk about is uh, what is called high-level orgasm, and this is what the class coming up is teaching. So it starts July 23rd, and it's going to run through August into September. So this class talks about the path to high-level orgasm. And the reason it is so important is um, what we're saying is that orgasm is one of the few functions that the body can do which seeks to align all four bodies at the same time. So in most people, the cell body is not on the same page as the energy body. It's not on the same page as the light body. And so they're all kind of operating independently, sort of. And there are certain things that people can do. Uh, for instance, when they're trying to self-heal, when they're trying to heal, it tries to align those bodies up to get that healing done. The most active way that, that humans, activity humans engage in is orgasm. Orgasm attempts to align those three lower bodies up. It's usually not successful, but that's what it's trying to do. And the higher the orgasm that you can generate, the more it's saying that you have this ability to line these three bodies up. High-level orgasm is when you get out of regular sexual orgasms and the orgasms are capable of generating DMT uh, enzymes in the brain which allows you uh, expanded consciousness and therefore it's like a shortcut to being able to access certain gifts so the high level orgasm you know that we describe it as full body orgasm breast orgasms core orgasms ESR expanded sexual response um, there's all kinds of names for it but when when the woman is put into high-level orgasm, temporarily, she has some introduction to, to this higher state of consciousness where it's not just a pleasure event, but it's also something that happens to her temporary. And what we want to do is get the woman to a place of evolution where she's able to generate this state on her own with any male partner. And so when she gets to that point in time, she can use high-level mm -hmm. orgasm uh, to help her activate any of her four archetypes, including the seated hawk. That class is coming up. Uh, it's, it's, it's featured on our website now, um, and I, I guess you could post a link on the, on the uh, feed there. But those two things I would recommend, the book, Awakening the Master Feminine, and the course coming up in July, uh, The Path to High-Level Orgasm. Powerful. I totally can uh, vouch uh, for, for this. Uh, I, I'm looking at the Awakening the Master Feminine right now on, my, on the table here. And so definitely, family, uh, second that emotion for sure. Uh, hey, definitely, again, Master Yao, uh, appreciate your time, appreciate your wisdom and all the hard work that it took for you to get to this. It, you know, A lot of people may listen to you and 
the, the sage-like information that comes out now, but, you know, this is taking many iterations for you, you know, on your journey. You know, this is not, you didn't grow up in the mountains, you know, uh, in the lotus position, you know. <laughs> so definitely appreciate your, your journey and uh, what you've done to be bringing this with the family right now. Thank you. It's my pleasure. For sure. Much love and appreciation to you. And family, uh, same to you all, too. Thank you for listening, those you listening right this moment, um, and those of you listening in that moment we call the future. Uh, uh, sending much love and, and, you know, good vibrations to you all as well. And, uh, you know, again, you know, family, you're listening to Full Show Holistic Health on Blog Talk Radio, and I'm your host, Shofar, from Full Show Energy Work. Uh, keep that S-E-X in your life. Keep strengthening, keep expanding, keep shining, keep evolving, and do so exponentially. Peace.